Thank you very much. It connects us to opening us to understanding high levels of consciousness. In Hinduism, we got the Om, the primordial creative source. The Egyptians sang the universe into creation. All comes to sound. And you can see this, how these days of creation and the creation, the sound of creation is manifested in some of the symbology used in sacred geometry. For example, Christianity can be very quickly described with sacred geometric principles. And you realize that the creator of the universe is not some guy with a white beard sitting on a cloud. You know, that's just complete fairy tale stuff and very distinct part of the control system of humanity. That division principle plays itself out in that philosophy. Well, the Omani Padme Hum, you, sound, you see sound frequencies related to the creation process. And when you see this, you realize that we're dealing with sound, six resonance ratios. Is that te um, Nikola Tesla said that the earth rings like a bell. It's continuously ringing like a bell. Most of us, and we're all trying to emulate that, but I believe that he was talking about the sound of Gaia, an unlimited free source of energy. This is a guy called Peter Davy in New Zealand. Since 1940, this guy's been boiling water with sound, sound frequency. Because everything has a resonance. Everything in the creation and in physical form has its own fundamental resonant frequencies. I'll just talk about levitating things with sound, not just sound, but also with mind and thought. Now, we hear about it all the time, but until you see something being levitated by sound, it's difficult to comprehend. Here's I mean, the higher the frequency, the higher the energy. So these polystyrene items are very light, so the, the, the frequency is lower frequency that's audible to our ears. So when you're trying to levitate giant Those blocks, attached, you'd need very high frequencies that you can't hear, and then it looks like magic. Also, I'm so look at this 3D bubble that is created as sound. Remember, sound is a three-dimensional thing. From the pop, it goes in all directions. It's not a, a wave on a piece of paper. It's a three-dimensional effect. That, and they used the source of sound as a source of energy. But they were actually resonating cavities to create huge amounts of energy. And they would have looked something like this. What's also clear to me, the more research I do, especially at the sites in South Africa, realizing that we're dealing with sound and light, that they probably used light to activate some of these sound devices. They were actually resonating chambers, that it was activated by light. This is some interesting symmetrical interference patterns that were taken at Stonehenge. So it's a very, very advanced de device, Stonehenge. And what blew my mind is how old Stonehenge is. This is probably one of the oldest sites on earth. It's way, probably more than a million years old. Oh, this in stone. It's very, very hard. One of the hardest stones known to us. There's the break. Does that look like a 5,000 year old break in erosion? Absolutely not. We're dealing with hundreds of thousands, probably millions of years of erosion to erode about this far. This is like the stone circles in South Africa in their incredible state of disrepair, are still giving us insane amount of energy that we don't know what to do with. This is another example of how st old Stone Age is. That crack was clearly not there when the builders built it. You wouldn't put a lintel up with a crack in it. So we have to assume the crack happened after the event. And look at the erosion around the crack. I mean, this is insane amount of erosion. So modern-day levitator. Southern Florida, this guy called Ed Lee Scullin in the 20s bought, built this amazing place called Coral Castle. This is still a mystery to a lot of people, or they don't know about it. And he single-handedly put these giant blocks on top of each other, carved them, sculpted them, shaped them on his own. The interesting thing is when, when they used to bring these, these uh, the trucks used to deliver these rocks, he would, he would uh, offload them single-handedly. And nobody knew how he did it. He always made the guy stand around the corner or something like that until one day two young schoolboys saw him offloading these giant coral blocks. And they came home very excited saying, hey, mommy, mommy, we saw the guy. And uh, they asked, how did he do it? And the kid said, well, he did it with ice cream cones in his hands, two ice cream cones. And the parents imagined, ah, naughty children, what are you talking about? You're trying to force us into buying your ice cream for dinner, right? Well, that's not true. When I heard that, I got extremely excited because that is consistent with what I've been finding in Southern Africa ice cream cones, cone-shaped tools. And I find many of these cone-shaped tools scattered all over Southern Africa, among the ruins, wherever you go. I was up the mountain two weeks ago, again, walking through areas that I've never been before. Remember, at this stage, I'm the only guy researching this, the whole of Southern Africa. It's like 
I'm the only guy researching Egypt. That's the equivalent of that. There's one guy in all of Egypt let loose to do, you know, try and get some sanity out of this. And uh, so I feel a little lonely, so come help. <laughs> so the, the, just to show you that these ice cream cone, cone shaped tools are everywhere, they, there are thousands of them. I've just collected a few because after a while you get bored. You know, say, oh, there's another one over there. And uh, then you get to, these, to the Rosicrucian Museum in the United States, and guess what I find? These cone-shaped tools on display with Sumerian writing on it, uh, Sumerian cuneiform writing on it, commemorating the building of the temples in Sumer. And remember, it's not the obsession of humans with gold. It's the God's obsession with gold. In Genesis 2, when Adam was alone on earth, Eve had not yet been fashioned from his rib. God comes to Adam and says, hey, buddy, there's a place called Havilah. It's land full of milk and honey. The land is good. The water is good. And by the way, buddy, there's gold. What on earth is going on here? Why would God, the creator of the universe and all things in it, the commander of consciousness, want to tell Adam about gold? And the divine creator of all things does not want gold. He doesn't take credit cards and he doesn't use money. The ancient history of Southern Africa is all about gold. You can't, you know, the whole Monomotapa kingdom that was attacked by everybody from the north and they could never be overthrown, the, the golden kings of Monomotapa. Fascinating story. Not many people are even aware of it. What do other ancient cultures or other ancient texts tell us? Well, the Sumerian tablets tell us in great detail about the Anunnaki. And all the great biblical stories are first found in the Sumerian tablets in much greater detail. And slaves, let us create a Lulu, a primitive worker, the hardship work to take over. Let the being, the toil of the Anunnaki, carry on his back. A primitive worker shall be created. Our command will he understand. Our tools he will handle. To the Anunnaki in the Abzu, relief shall come. So we know that the Anunnaki were in the Abzu. They were doing something. They needed relief. And for this, they needed a slave. And they cloned it. And boy, did they do a good job. His house, his minds, and his technology. In the midst of the Abzu, to a place of pure waters, Enki betook himself. In that land, a place of deepness, he determined for the heroes into the earth's bowels to descend. Before they cloned the slaves or the, 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 the human race, they referred to the Anunnaki who were doing the gold mining as the heroes because they were doing the hard work in the gold mines. So that, for the heroes into earth's bowels to descend. The earth splitter that Enki established, now I'm going to show you the earth splitter because this is one of my discoveries in South Africa. Um, Therewith in the earth a gash to make, by way of tunnels, earth's innards to reach, the golden veins to uncover. Boy, now that we found the physical evidence in South Africa and Zimbabwe, mostly, suddenly Sitchin's work becomes like poetry because we can point to what he's referring to. We've got the physical evidence for which he's often undergone a lot of criticism, you know. Oh, he's making this stuff up. Well, you know, anyone who's still a naysayer about Sitchin's work, wake up. We got the physical evidence. It's there in beyond believable abundance. Is there a ruin or a settlement that could be linked to Enki? Absolutely. And this is Great Zimbabwe, the greatest ruin in southern Africa. It has to be the biggest, right? This is uh, just a spectacular place. And uh, just to show you, I mean, some of the walls are 10 meters high and 6 meters wide. Great Zimbabwe is a spectacular site. And it has got Enki's energetic imprint all over it. Any of you that do energetic work, go and look at it. You're not going to believe your eyes. What's so special about the ruins in southern Africa? Well, they're very special cattle kraal for very special cattle. Because this is probably where the word holy cow comes from. Because uh, <laughs> Because most of these cattle kraal are built aligned to the sun and the stars and the equinoxes and the solstices. And, and wow, they went to a lot of trouble for these cattle, didn't they? And the sacred geometry. And you start seeing how sacred geometric principles just jump out of it, uh, out of these structures. And you realize, hold on, this is not just somebody building, uh, building things you know, to pass time. They were, and clearly that was, this was easy to these people because every single one of these ruins that is measured, and this is all Johann Heine's original pioneering work for which you'll always be remembered because every ruin that he's measured so far turns out to have these very intricate alignments and this is spectacular and you'll understand why this is so spectacular when you realize how many of these ruins there are these you know look at this the perfect and you draw a circle over there 
which doesn't look, it doesn't look like it, it, it's real. But when you extrapolate that flat line into the circle, you get a perfect, perfect hexagon. When you start joining the corners of the hexagon, look how it touches the inner circle perfectly. You know, this is not accidental, people. This takes real um, exact science and understanding. There you go. So these structures down there are not just simplistic structures. They carry huge amounts of energy. And uh, important to note that there are no doors or entrances. This is an important thing that you find in some of the archaeological reports. But, and they say, oh, there are no doors and entrances. And then they forget about it. And then they tell you, it was probably built by a migrating crew, group of 15 to 20 people. And they built it. And you say, hold on, you just told me there are no doors and entrances. And now you're telling me that it was built by people as, as a dwelling. So what's going on here? What, what, what are we dealing with here? And, and you, you don't get intelligent answers from the so-called authorities on this. Um, and agricultural terraces, thousands of kilometers of agricultural terraces. In fact, more than 450,000 square kilometers of agricultural terraces in a sparsely populated part of the world. Who built these terraces? What were they planting in these terraces? What's going on here? It doesn't fit. It doesn't match. Terraces are everywhere. When you start looking and opening your eyes, Mountains are covered by these terraces. This is in Botswana. This is in Lesotho. There are terraces up some of the most incredible steep mountain uh, sides that don't make any sense. In fact, if you go into Google Earth and you look at Lesotho, I challenge you to find any part of Lesotho without terraces. It's actually quite incredible. There are just terraces everywhere. And there's just been no people down there to build these terraces. So where do they come from? This is one of the greatest examples because you can see the, the channels that link them, the circles and the terraces, all one giant grid. Nothing stands alone. Remember I told you, look at around the circles, the stuff hidden by the soil, because there are no standalone circles. They're all part of a giant grid, a huge grid. No standalone, all connected by these weird channels that are clever people at university call roads to drive the cattle on. <laughs> this is why these... The roads are there because they were built because the people 200 years ago built them to drive their cattle on. And that's as far back as they go. Maybe 400 years ago, that's it. This is just spectacular. This is right up the road from where I live. So when I leave my house and I go walking in the mountains, this is what I walk in, in these places. And, I, you know, it's rather silly. So I take a lot of photographs and, and I write a whole bunch of stuff and then I come talk to people like you and, and I feel like I'm, you know, alone, lost in the world. <laughs> um, Ancient, ancient, ancient roads and channels run for hundreds of miles. Notice, circle, channel, and the extrapolation or the extension of the circle that looks like a giant spider's web. And it's these giant spider's web that turn into these agricultural terraces. And there's a very specific reason why this is all connected, which you'll understand soon. Look at these archaeological drawings from 1939, clearly showing us that there are no doors and entrances, and then these circles are all connected like a bunch of grapes. And then they don't make any more comments about it. They just leave it. The roads link every stone circle. There's a road there. It's very, very badly eroded, as you can see. Most of the times you don't even know you're walking on these, on these uh, ruins. Over there at the bottom, it used to connect in there, but that looks like water washed it away at some stage. Look at this linking into these strange hexagonal things. There's not enough time to talk about that, but there's spectacular information about what is going on there. Uh, and there's ruins there and there, but they're just covered by soil. This is a beautiful example of a channel running into a so with all the stuff around it, the spider's web effect. Look at this. Now, I imagine most of Southern Africa looking like this a long, long time ago. And um, these are all cattle crawl, as I said, built for special cattle. There were a lot of cattle. Boy, they were just, uh, I don't know where the people were, but there are a lot of cattle. <laughs> hey, maybe. Uh, how many of these ruins are there? And this is where the penny really drops when you start figuring out how many there were. In 1891, the brilliant Theodore Bent, this is one of the only, one of the few archaeologists that I carry real respect for. Um, wrote a brilliant book, The Vanished uh, Lost Cities of Mashona Land, and it's a phenomenal um, book. And in 1891, from horseback, traveling through South Africa, Botswana, Zimbabwe, he estimated about 4,000 of these structures. 
Then by 1974, Roger Summers, who had more technology available, calculated about 20,000 of these stone ruins. Now, by now, I started going, hold on, 20,000 stone ruins in a sparsely populated continent doesn't make any sense. I got involved in 2007 when Jan Heiner introduced me to this, and within six months, I estimated at least 100,000 ruins. So I thought, well, before I release temples of the African gods, I can't just thumb suck the stuff. Let me have some sort of at least scientific argument for this. So I started counting. I used Google and aerial shots and, and uh, just started counting, you know, and extrapolating, getting averages per hectare, per square kilometer, per larger area. And I went all over Southern Africa and found these densely clustered areas and got averages. And... Um, and some of the aerial photographs looks like, you know, there's circles here. When you look closer at it, when you study this, you see how connected they were. Um, this is all over southern Africa. Some of them are in, in, in the Transvaal or in Gauteng, what used to be the Transvaal, in, in Pumalanga, in the Orange Free State. It's there some in, in Natal, KZN. I just found some in KZN two weeks ago when I traveled to KZN. And I hadn't found any before. So wherever you go, you find more, more ruins. Zimbabwe, Botswana, as I mentioned, um, and this one I'll be talking about again. Um, this is near a town called Bronco Sprite, very strange looking structures. This is again close to my house, and uh, this is south of Johannesburg. There are thousands and thousands of these south of Johannesburg, and they think they discovered gold there in the late 1800s. <laughs> And this is just spectacular. It's the density of these, this is other side of Rustenburg where I grew up near the platinum mines uh, on the way to Botswana. This is just, this runs about five by five kilometers and it's just dense like this. It's ridiculous. And this is back uh, near where I live just to show you the circles with the channels connecting them and the terraces. And by the time I finished counting, getting all these averages, I found out there were more than 10 million of these. So forget 4,000 and 20,000 and 100,000, more than 10 million of these. In fact, I cannot tell you categorically, it's probably closer to 20 million of these. And, uh, and we'll be surprised if there aren't more. It's spectacular. We're dealing with the largest and most mysterious ancient civilization on earth that no one's paid any attention to until now. What happened to them? What happened to 10 million stone structures and the people? Forget the stone structures. We've got evidence of those. Where are the bones? We're the dead people. There's nothing, not a trace of who occupied these. Isn't that more mysterious in itself that for an extended period of, I'll show you, about 280,000 years, people lived and worked here? Then no fossil remains of these people. What on earth went on here? This is where you start listening to people like Dranvela Melchizedek. When he says that, you know, human populations have been evacuated and moved from one planet to another. You go, well, hold on. You know, suddenly that makes a little bit more sense than anything else. Because we should have found bones. You know, there's been a lot of digging, mining, and there should be bones everywhere. Farmers, building houses. So what happened to them? This is where the Sumerian tablets become very important. And the king's list, I'm going to come back to this, because in, this, in the, the two king's lists that give us exactly the same story, they give us the names of eight kings that ruled for about 200, between 220 and 241,000 years. The names of the kings are the same. The places they ruled are exactly the same. The dates vary a little bit. So you've got to allow some you know, mistakes in translation. But the names and places remain the same. This is very, very interesting. But what this, Sumerian, what this tells us is two very important things that I'm going to come back to later. And this is a repetitive theme in the Sumerian text. Is after the kingship descended from heaven to earth, after kingship was lowered to earth from heaven. Okay. To us, it doesn't make any sense. Oh, we think it's some crap made up by the ancient people because they were all stupid, right? And, uh, and then it tells us who these kings were and how long they lived. And you can clearly see that they weren't human because they, li they lived and ruled for 36,000 years, 64,000 years, 28,000 years. And then a very important thing that it tells us, a very important statement from these two kings lists. And then the flood swept over. So two very important things, three, three important things. That kingship was lowered to earth from heaven. Somebody up there decided that they were going to appoint some kings on earth, some priest kings. That change all, changes all of human history. It tells us that they ruled for an extended period of time. And then the flood came. So we seem to have a history, a chronology of human history until the flood. Prior to this. Or well, until now, we know very little about what happened before the flood. 
And this is very important. So I believe that when they say the flood came, that's what destroyed these ruins. Some 12 to 13,000 years ago, the so-called Great Flood that there's not much argument about in geologic and archaeological circles. And you can see the sedimentation. That's why most of these ruins are not visible. Most of them are covered by soil. They're hidden from us. And wherever there are stone circles, there are gold mines. You can't get away from it. More than 75,000 gold mines have been found between 2005 and 2010 in a geological survey just around the little town of Leidenburg in the Mpumalanga province. 75,000 gold mines. In the 30s, I've got two distinct separate reports from two separate miners that mined in the province of Limpopo, northern South Africa, that found mysterious mine shafts, tunnels like this, at about 100 feet down while they were mine, mining gold. Remain unexplained. Tools and artifacts were confiscated by the authorities, never to be returned. In the 1990s, De Beers found a mine shaft 22,000 feet deep that scared them. That they, they say it was cut with absolute precision, indicated some advanced laser technology that they do not possess. Anglo-American, I know, has a secret file that they keep for covering up ancient mines and shafts. Anytime they come, up across, come across an ancient shaft or a mine, they cover it up and move on. They don't even discuss it, but they have a specific file for that. And I was told this by the chief geologist, the Anglo-American, while we were having a beer at a pub. <laughs> he just volunteered this information to me. I was amazed. But then he didn't know who I was or what I was doing. <laughs> Sneaky bastard. <laughs> what kind of stone are we dealing with here? It's a very special kind of stone. It's known as hornfels. And it's known by geologists as ringstone. And I was the first person, I mean, I'm astounded, the first person to ask what kind of stone was used to build these ruins. They just, you know, don't go there. And uh, it's metamorphosized quartzite. It's incredibly hard. You can't break it, people. Yeah, I've tried to break some of these. This, is, this sliver is a break I keep in my museum. It, this happens as a result of heat. You expose it to fire, it breaks up. So clearly they didn't use fire in any of these ruins. Otherwise, they'd be none left. As you can see, it's black on the inside, very hard, and then it's got this stuff called patina, the skin, like a skin that grows. It's an oxidization and, and calcification process. It grows incredibly slowly on this specific rock. And what is fascinating about this Hornfell stone is that it conducts sound incredibly well. It rings like bell and light. There's some more examples that I found that I keep in the museum and uh, more spectacular examples. And just to show you, what? there's a little. The most remarkable artifacts that I've collected, um, this particular stone in my hand here, this beautiful Stone Age club, it looks like something out of Flintstones. Uh, and to, I'm gonna show you how they ring like bells um, because I can't carry these with me all over the world. So a quick, demonstration how these stones ring like bells. I just discovered that in geological terms these stones, this particular stone, the Hornfels in South Africa, is also known as ring stone for that very specific reason. And to ring these I'm going to use my brand new tool that I just collected about a, month, a week ago. This phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal artifact. Um, and I'm going to use this to ring these stones. This looks, we always joked when I found this, that this looks like a, a Stone Age guitar. And it's pretty much like that, you know. And uh, I'm going to show you that it is very closely related to a musical instrument in ancient times for very specific reasons. Now, you might think that the stone shape is just accidental and that it broke off or something. You'd be mistaken because I've collected probably about four or five stones that are very, very similar in shape, very similar um, carving structure, this broad base here, and then down to a narrow tip, and somebody removed this particular piece of the stone over there for specific reasons, as you will hear, which I'll ring a little bit more, uh, they ring like bells. But um, it's also important to note that you cannot carve or chip this stone. It will splinter and fragment, and it will not be chipped or carved. Okay, so these, these shapes that we see here must have been molded in some way and molded for specific acoustic properties. And this is why. You've got to hold it a very specific way to make as little contact as possible to get it to ring and resonate at its optimum. Now remember it's also covered in patina 
the skin of the rock, this brown reddish color that covers the rock that is no longer the original black or charcoal color, the original color of the, um, the metamorphosized quartzite that's underneath. And that's how it rings. I can actually feel my fingers underneath are deadening the ringing because I'm holding it and it's deadening some of the effect. There we go. That's better. That's what you want. You realize that this thing really rings like a bell and it reverberates for quite a long time. Alright, and now to show you that this is not the only one, here's the other one. The Stone Age Club. And I drove over this myself a few times, driving up the mountain uh, of the forest road, and eventually I stopped and picked it up because I realized this is one of the most remarkable tools that you will ever find, and thank God I did. And it is very heavy. I'm out of breath because I'm holding my breath not to make a noise. And this thing weighs probably about 15 kilos. So. And there you go. Demonstration how these stones ring like bells. And they were used in all kinds of ways and fashions just like the Ankh to create specific vibrational frequencies and specific notes to use as a form and a source of energy. And just to remind you, metamorphosized quartzite is full of what? So, we can talk about this later, when we start getting into the consciousness principles. What are we really dealing with here? And what do these ancient sites contain? How much information is actually stored in these ancient sites? Yes. Just a quick question with the stones there. I noticed that the frequency was the same. It seems to be the same note. Did you actually ever try and measure the exact frequency? Yes, we did. Uh, we measured. It were not not those two. I haven't tested those two. But uh, I was somebody emailed me. I get thousands of emails. Somebody emailed me saying that's a B flat, I think. Uh, and uh, that is very important. But it's just not enough time to go through all the stuff. Sorry. <laughs> And then uh, the, all these anomalous tools I've been collecting and finding, strange tools. Once again, some of them are these cone-shaped tools, always to these points. And then the stone phallus, stone phalluses seem to be um, very popular in these ancient times. Um, what's important to note, see how the patina has covered all of them, remember? Somebody must have carved them or shaped them at some stage. And they're all covered in this brown patina. Okay, keep that at the back of your mind. Uh, this is at the top of the big ruin on top of the mountain there, that's spectacular, whatever that is, uh, a bird-shaped stone, or a, there's a whole other link to the Zimbabwe birds that is in here, but uh, we can't go there. Um, these strange tools and artifacts that are just spectacular, that make no sense to us today, because it's not part of normal archaeological you know, um, stuff that they exhibit. And then the most spectacular mystery in, in all of archaeology, the sacred stones, the special sacred stones. Hundreds of thousands have been found in southern Africa. Now, because we had a, a breakthrough energy conference, you'll automatically notice that they resemble a, a torus shape. So I'm giving you a little hint as to what these are for. But in South Africa, the Archaeological Society has it as a logo, and they will still teach you that these are weights for digging sticks, that the people made them, in the hundreds of thousands, when there were only a few thousand hunter-gatherers, because this is from the Stone Age, right? So there were no metal tools. They made this with other stones because they needed weights for their digging sticks when they were digging for roots in the felt. I can't think of anything more insane. These people should be locked up. <laughs> Where's the flagship among all these ruins? And this is where we get to the very important Adam's calendar. It was rediscovered in 2003 by Johann Heiner, and he'll always be remembered for that because this is one of the most spectacular discoveries in all of human archaeological history. These are the two central calendar stones. 
Baba Kreda Mutwa, the preeminent African shaman, told me when I saw him, there you can see Adam's calendar and my other book lying on the desk. When I showed him this book, he burst into tears and took quite a while to, to calm himself down. He said he never thought he'd see that sacred place again. He was initiated at this place in 1937 as a young shaman, and he calls it Inzalo Yelanga, or birthplace of the sun. Specifically, the S-O-N, not S-U-N, because it is believed by the shaman that this is where the gods created humanity, birthplace of the sun. That's what it looks like from a helicopter, circular structure. That is north, that is south, not the trees, the stones under the trees. Um, there are the two central calendar stones. And over there, you see a wooden pole. That's where the stone man used to stand. And right from the stone man across there, across the Horus bird lying there, which you'll see we looking east, exactly east at the rise of the sun, on the edge of this cliff, which is known as the Transvaal Escarpment. There's looking north, exactly north, between the two stones. You can see north-south line goes right between the two central calendar stones. And uh, why is it a calendar? This is Jan Heine showing me for the, for, of our very first visit there. Why it's a calendar, and he did all the original calculations when he rediscovered it. This setting sun casts a shadow. This rock casts a shadow on this one. And you can tell every day of the year from the summer solstice on this side until the winter solstice on that side, and it comes back. So it's still an accurate calendar. And one of the few that I know, uh, I, I can't think of any others that do this, uh, monolithic calendars or, or Stone Age calendars. This is a 3D reconstruction that we did. Um, putting the stone man back in his place, who was removed in 1994 by the Minister of uh, Environmental Affairs, <laughs> to put a plaque on it to commemorate the opening of the Blue Swallow Nature Reserve. Isn't that ironic? <laughs> Desecrating one of the oldest sites on earth. <laughs> and then they try and prevent us going there because we're bringing tourists there and we, we're desecrating the place. <laughs> and there you have, uh, looking out east from the stone man across the, the calendar stones, very distinct Horus stone, looking at what? Three stones that seem to align with those pyramidal structures over there that are aligned with the rise of Orion over there. But you'll see more um, about that now. How do we date the stones? We look at everything. I'll look at anything because you can't date stones. So you've got to look at everything. Use your, you know, do what the guys in CSI do. Follow the clues and the evidence. And what makes most sense, you have to go with that. So first of all, this is, every stone there is known as dolerite. It doesn't belong there. It is now categorically proven and shown from geological studies that those stones do not belong there. They were brought there by somebody to build the calendar site. That's the edge of the Transvaal Escarpment. It's known as Black Reef Quartzite, and it's full of gold. <laughs> There's a gold mine underneath that ridge, actually, an ancient gold mine. The erosion, that piece there broke off there. Uh, that's the erosion on the tip of that ridge, uh, on the break. Um, most geologists I've asked suggested to me, uh, pick a number above 50,000 years for the amount of erosion that happened there. So 50,000 years ago, that piece broke off and landed there. Right? So now we're starting to get to the ancient age of this. But this is one of my best, is the patina growth, because I've told you already that these, these tools have been molded and shaped, and the patina has grown back. That's what it looks like when the patina is gone, black, and then the patina grows back. This is a great example of a monolith in one of the stone walls that at some point broke and this tip broke off. Look at the patina that's grown back. At the, there's about two millimeters of patina growth. We're dealing with something. This patina is known to grow at about 1,000 one, 1, years per microscopic layer. 1,000 years per microscopic layer. So for a millimeter or two millimeters of patina, we're dealing with something that's 100, 200, 300,000 years old. We don't really have a measure for it, but it's extremely old. And uh, we know that this is not normal archaeology. Look at this beautiful carving of one of the stone structures. So not only did they build the stone circles, but they first carved them into rock. This is another interesting part of this presentation that I normally go into a lot more detail. But look at after they carved this, this crack appeared through the rock. This hornfell horn stone, you should see the black of the hornfells on the crack. On a fresh crack, you'll see the black of the hornfowls. But it's so old that the patina has grown into the crack and completely covered up the black color. So this shows us how old this carving is. So we're dealing with probably 50 to 100,000 years old that this carving is. So these are the kind of indicators that we have to use when you deal with this, with this kind of evidence. Because you can't follow the normal archaeological routes. They just 
don't have the tools to do that. But this, my friends, is by far the most important discovery, I believe. If you look at the circular, you can see the whole Adam's calendar is a circular structure, north-south. But the first thing that you notice is that it's not at 12 o'clock. It's not true north. It's slightly left of center. So Johan Heine and I had it measured, and we found out that there's a 3, three degrees, 17 minutes, and 42 second deviation anti-clockwise. Now, that's not possible, because we're not dealing with magnetic north. We're dealing with true north. And at first, we thought that this had something to do with the processional wobble. So I spent a lot of months trying to analyze and speak to experts in processional counting and all that. And I realized, hold on, I'm barking up the wrong tree. This is true north. Wherever you are in the processional wobble, true north stays at true north. Right? So what's going on here? This is three and a quarter degrees deviation. I believe that the man that holds all the information is Charles Habgood, who's been trying to t teach us about crustal displacement and crustal shift. I believe that Adam's calendar is a real geophysical example that crustal shift displacement did happen. Because these guys did not make mistakes. They would not have accidentally built a three and a quarter degrees out of alignment. It's not going to happen. So, we know that crustal displacement happened, we just don't know when. But here we have physical, geophysical evidence that it did occur. And then obviously the Orion connection. You can't get away from the Orion connection. All ancient cultures do it. I've mentioned it already. Those three. There's your Horus stone. And very, look at that distinctly carved rock there. Those three, if you lift them up, they align precisely with the rise of Orion's belt. When it was flat on the horizon. I've had two separate calculations done by two separate um, astronomers. Both of those will be wrong because not, none of them took into account that three and a quarter degree um, misalignment. So, but it just shows you that they, their calculations are really, really old. That's really interesting. I didn't cross-examine on them. And uh, just to show you these, this beautiful horror stone, I discovered that one morning when I went there uh, with another guy very, very early when I started doing this exploration. And that stone was covered by soil. So we couldn't see. I didn't know that it was actually a Horus or a bird-shaped stone. But then we, when I moved the, the soil away from about there, suddenly this beautiful head and nose appeared. It doesn't look like much from here, but there's nothing to stand on to take photographs. You know, if I step, take one step backwards that way, I, I fall off the edge of the cliff. So. <laughs> um, and there you go. It's about three and a half meters tall. There's a fat belly there that you can't see on this angle. And the nose is broken off. It's probably maybe another foot there that would have extended. If you lift it up, there you go, it reconstructed Adam's calendar. When I called it Adam's calendar, I had no idea how close to the truth it was. This is where humanity was created according to ancient African culture, where the Anunnaki artificially, genetically created the Adamu, the human species that we all belong to in various forms and shapes. And then we get to the discovering of the pyramids. The mystery just, you know, gets... Better and better. Look at that. This is one of the first pictures taken of Johan in 2003 when he started measuring the calendar and finding out all these mysteries. One of the best pictures because I've been there thousands of times and you just don't get good pictures of the pyramidal structures. There's a third one, a little one over there just sticking its head out. I've been told through various means that there's about 30 meters of sedimentation down there. So we're only probably seeing half of those pyramidal structures um, because of the flood, remember? <coughs> the flood that destroyed all the stuff. That would have covered all of it. Why are they pyramids? Do I, why am I so convinced they're pyramids? For various reasons. First of all, when you go into Adam's calendar, the moment you cross the circle, because there's no obvious circle, it's an imaginary circle. The moment you cross that circle with your GPS, you lose signal. Okay, it works, this, it works here. The moment you walk in there, your signal is gone. And I love the macho guys. They just love it. Oh, my GPS will work. You'll see. I'll show you how my GPS works. <laughs> <laughs> and they go in there. <laughs> It's, it's fantastic watching them. Just see that ego drop very quickly. <laughs> and then when you take the same GPS down to the pyramids, I stood, there were four of us. I will forever regret not taking a photograph of it because there were four of us standing with GPSs like this. And every GPS gave you a completely different reading. Not just slightly off, but miles off. You were like, you know, in, an, in another province. It was insane, right between the two pyramids. Not only that, but... All these ancient cultures built things according to the sacred geometric principles. So I thought, hold on, this will tell me if it's linked or not. Let me draw a golden mean spiral from Adam's calendar and see where it lands. <coughs> well, you know, I didn't have to guess. You got it. 
So here we can do a beautiful twist on those that want to stick to mainstream science. And we can argue the argument of probability, which is one of the most commonly argued arguments in science, isn't it? Probability. So the probability factor that the golden mean spiral accidentally ends between the pyramids is so completely out of kill that it has to be linked. You're dealing with several million or several billion uh, odds to one that it's you know, an accident. So the probability factor plays a very important role here. We're dealing with something that's connected. And uh, also through channelings and other psychic revelations, I've been told in no uncertain terms that we're dealing with some very advanced stuff here. And then when you connect Adam's pyramids through Great Zimbabwe, Enki's house, it lands right in the Great Pyramid of Giza. And um, all along the 31 degrees east longitudinal line, the Nilotic Meridian, right, which is also linked to the white lions of Timbavati, the sacred white lions of Africa. And you start seeing all this connection. It, it's just beautiful. It just unravels more and more. And then my beautiful friend Willem de Swart, who's decoded the numeric system and the secret numbers of God, made it very clear to me that the name Elohim is, equates to the number 31. El Elohim. 31 degrees east longitudinal line. So this gives us an indication that the Anunnaki and the Elohim are the same group of beings. I just recently did an interview with George Nuri. The very last caller that called in told me he was abducted by the Anunnaki 12 years ago before he knew any of the stuff we're talking about here. They told him they were tall, about nine feet tall, blonde, blue-eyed individuals. They told him they were the Anunnaki, and they also told him they were often referred to as El or Elohim. That was very interesting, and then the show ended. So I need to talk to him more. So what were all these stone circles for? S millions and millions of stone structures all connected. Each one is completely unique, different, built with stones that ring like bells. What's going on here? Archaeological drawings show us that there are no doors and entrances, and some of them are concentric circles, like expansion, amplification chambers, or something to that extent, right? So are these connectors, these channels, actually like wires? Absolutely. So let's go back to what Nikola Tesla said. He said the earth rings like a bell and it's an inexhaustible source of energy if you know how to use the sound frequency of Gaia. And I believe that this is what it is. The cymatic patterns remind us of what we're looking at. The shape of Om. This is the shape of Ah, sand on a metal plate. That's what you'll find. So what we're looking at here is cymatic patterns from earth. Each one of these stone circles just simply represents the cymatic Freak or the shape of the sound of Gaia at that particular point. And this is why they connected. So they created one huge energetic field. There's one example. There's a Hans Jenny's photograph, the circle in the middle and the, the spider's web effect outwards, the circle in the middle, spider's web effect outwards, except these were connected so they could share the energy they suck out of Mother Earth. And, uh, but how much energy could these structures create? For this, we've got to go to 1944 in Japan when they were de developing the death ray with which they were going to smite the Allied army. But unfortunately, they got nuked, so they never got to use the death ray. But one of the things that I found out is that at the, at the core of this death ray was a, a thing that they used called a magnetron, a, a resonant cavity magnetron. Well, this is, uh, you know, you start a frequency in the middle, you amplify it in these resonant cavities until you decide when you want to take it out of the wires. And that magnetron is used in laser beams, it's used in microwaves, it's, 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 a, it's a technological tool used in many applications. This has got a little magnetron in it, or a klystron, I think it's called in this. And, uh, and then it goes through what? It goes through a crystal to focus the light. Right? So if you're working with light, you need to use crystal because it lets the light go through it. Right? So... I believe that this magnetron was used, there you go. If a magnetron a few centimeters in diameter could blast, fry the allied, allied army, how much energy can a magnetron 22 meters in diameter create? Huge amounts of energy. In fact, I was made aware that it's this structure that was probably responsible for the destruction of Atlantis because they didn't quite know how to use it and it got out of control. Um, so I believe when you read those translations of Sitchin, where he says Enki built the earth splitter with which in the earth a gash to make, I believe this is the earth splitter or something like that, creating huge amounts of energy, putting it into the giant grid, giant energy grid 
that connected all these stone structures in southern Africa. And that's really what it was. Everything was linked to the mining of gold. None of these were dwellings, people. We're dealing with a giant energy and work grid for the extraction and the mining and the processing of gold. And then get to the measuring of, the, of these stone structures. And uh, I found a guy who had a very interesting device that he, he measured without me. And then I came back from America and I heard that he went and measured these. I called him back. I said, I want to go back and do it with you. So I went with him and he used to work in the satellite industry uh, for Centec. Uh, interesting guy. Um, and he's, the measurements that he showed me were just mind-blowing. Electromagnetic waves, either horizontal or vertical, coming out of the ground into the sky. Sound frequencies in, in, in hertz, the loudness in decibels, and also what he calls the heat signature. The heat signature that he explained to me, he measures up to, it's the average temperature of the ground below the soil, below the surface, down to about 300 meters. He's got all, all kinds of ways that he calculates this. I can't explain to you exactly how he does this, but I asked him several questions to cross-examine him to see if he was not you know, making it up, and it stayed constant. So... I believe that he does have a system to work this out. This is what he measured. The outside, um, the, the heat signature anywhere outside here is five and a half degrees Celsius at the surface of the, the ground. The moment you move the device in there, it shoots up to 29 degrees. So it's five and a half degrees, 29 degrees. Five and a half degrees, 20. There's no scientific explanation for that that we, that we have right now. You go in there, it goes up to 33 degrees. Five and a half degrees, 33 degrees in the middle. What's interesting, the electromagnetic field here runs at the equivalent of about 280 megahertz, but it's, it's vertical, straight out of the ground into the sky. So it's a column of energy out of the ground into the sky. Over there, it creates like a dome-shaped effect over the circle because you also lose GPS when you go in there. So I can now understand why you lose GPS, because it creates the circle. There's no electromagnetic activity outside. The moment you go inside there, you pick up this horizontal electromagnetic effect, equivalent to about 480 megahertz. Um, and he went into more explanation to me exactly how, how... Sorry, let's go back here. And then the sound frequency. The sound frequency you measured coming out of these walls at 14.5 gigahertz. Now, we don't measure sound frequencies at those. At those. This is really mysterious. So... Um, and at 72 decibels coming out of these walls. And then we went up to this one here, and it got even worse. Um, measured 33 gigahertz sound frequencies coming out of this, these walls inside here. 33 gigahertz. When you walk along this, this channel that ran in here, the wall was broken there, but the channel runs in there. It started like 5 degrees. It keeps going up. As you walk there, that heat signature keeps rising. By the way, the heat signature, you explained to me, can only go up to about 80 degrees Celsius, at which point it suggests that you've got a volcano under you about 300 meters below you. So that's how he's calculated it. And uh, so at 80 degrees is the max, you know, and nothing more is possible. So we go from 5.5, and, and by the time you get here, it's at 33 degrees. Um, 30, about 30, about, yeah, around 30 degrees there. When you go from outside there, five and a half degrees, onto that little attachment there, inside, shoots up to 58 degrees. Five and a half degrees, 58 degrees. There's just no reason why it should be doing that. And then the, the electromagnetic waves, once again, there's a dome-shaped horizontal effect that happens inside here at, at that uh, frequency. And it's horizontal. Also, this is why when we did... Ground penetrating radar, I used the world's leading company to do ground penetrating radar on three structures. This is one of them. There was another one, uh, one of those flower shaped ones, and then at Adam's calendar. And all the way through the ground penetrating radar exercise, we, um, I kept asking the guy, are you getting GPS signal? And he says, yeah, sure. And he had a really big GPS thing on his back, and I thought, okay, well, this is our measurements are down the drain. That's it. The guy was lying to me. And then I waited after working like a dog for a whole long weekend because to do this GPR is not easy. The GPR devices are not meant for rocky terrain. You know, you've got to drag this big box and up the rocks and down the rocks. And I had to do the dragging. So I worked my butt off for the whole weekend expecting some results. So, you know, a week goes by and I phone the guys in Joburg and I say, have you got any results for me? I'm dying to see the results. And they say, yeah, I know, we, we've got some problems with the, uh, I'll get back to you. A month goes by, nothing. Three months ago, eventually I said, just tell me what's going on. He says, look, we've got real problems with the GPS. Uh, every, everything is just completely scrambled. I don't know what happened. I'm really, really sorry. 
but this, it's just like complete garbage. This has never happened to us before. So I went, don't worry, it's okay. <laughs> you made me the happiest guy in the world <laughs> because now I know that our measurements are accurate. It looks like you're getting a reading, but you're getting garbage. So when they put it in the computer, the computer nearly blew up. It said, sorry, buddy, I don't like what you're feeding me. <laughs> and then we get to Adam's calendar, and everything we know, or we think we know, just flies out the window. There's the imaginary circle once again. And as you approach it, the heat signature is at 9.5 degrees. It's a little higher than the other places. As you cross that imaginary circle, remember, there's no wall. So 9.5 degrees, as you cross in there, it shoots up to 77 degrees. Nine and a half, seventy-seven degrees. But then when you go in between the two calendar stones, it shoots up to beyond 80 degrees, beyond what suggests you're standing on a volcano. This is bizarre stuff. Is this the human that enters there that makes the change? Or is it, if you leave a thermometer in there, is it the temperature? It's not a thermometer. No, this is special calculation. It's a heat signature. It's not the temperature of the ground. Okay, so it's, again, it's the average temperature that he explained to me about 300 meters below the surface, going up in temperature, suggesting that at about 80 degrees, that heat signature would equate to a volcano, volcanic activity. And then we measured the, the, uh, the, electromag the sound frequency, first of all, once again. Nothing outside. And then as you cross that imaginary circle inside, it shoots up to beyond 375 gigahertz. This is sound frequency. Now, I've never heard of anything before measuring sound frequency at these frequencies. In fact, I've had several people argue with me that sound doesn't exist at those frequencies. I say, oh, well, it just disappears. What happens to sound? It just disappears because we can't hear it. So there's an interesting debate to be had there with some of the brainy people out there. 375 degrees, uh, gigahertz sound frequency. That's insane. That's, that's ridiculous. But then the electromagnetic fields become very important in this discovery. Because as you cross in there, it shoots up to 1,700 megahertz, equivalent electromagnetic activity, horizontally, creating a dome-shaped effect. Again, this is why the GPS doesn't work inside there. But in between those two calendar stones in the middle, it shoots up even higher to 1,800, but vertically straight out of the ground into the sky. And that just blew my mind. Because that made me realize that we're dealing with something very special. Since I first started going there and taking psychics and connected people there, there have been hundreds that have told me things about the site that could not be told unless you knew something. So once again, the statistical probability that they were lying to me is out the window. They must be telling me the truth. And the recurring constant that thing that I've been told by, you know, strange woo-woo people, is that it's an active vortex and a portal. Now that we've measured it, I believe them. Because this is the kind of thing that we measure there. Electromagnetic waves run horizontally, vertically, and then uh, horizontally and then vertically coming out of it is one vertical shaft of electromagnetic waves straight into the sky. So what is this calendar site all about? What were they doing here? What were the Anunnaki doing here? They were getting gold. They were using the people to mine the gold, using advanced technology, Caesar technology, getting it off the planet. We know that they were getting it off the planet. Sitchin makes it very clear in his translations. But he says they, were, they would beam it up with skyships. I think he was very, very close to the truth, except the word skyships was misinterpreted in his translations. It wasn't skyships. It was a contraption like Adam's calendar. Beam up the gold, Scotty. Where do you want it? That's what we're dealing with here. They were getting the gold off the ground, off the earth, somewhere else. The gold isn't here. One of the biggest mysteries, where's Germany's gold? Where's the gold in the USA? The gold is missing. Suddenly, the, all, all the countries around the world are waking up that they don't have any gold. Well, this is an age-old story. It goes on for all of human history. Remember when the Spaniards arrived in the Americas and everywhere in the world, they found the native populations, they had all this gold, and they asked them, who does the gold belong to? There was always one answer they received, the gold belongs to the gods. And they were right, and they're getting it off the ground, off this planet. So, Caesar technology was only discovered in the 17th June 2009, this was reported on in some of the scientific journals, talking about sound as being used as laser beams, not light, sound. And they think it's very exciting because it's got greater applications in the military, obviously. And this is where the sacred stones come in. 
because I believe these are not only energy devices like toruses, toroid energy generating fields because of the special stone that they're made of, but they're also frequency converters. One frequency in, another frequency out. And I believe that these pointy stones, like Ed Leeds Kalnan, was reported to move the giant blocks with two ice cream cones in his hands. Well, you hold those two in your hands, it'll look like you're holding ice cream cones in your hands. And at the point where they cross, beaming high-frequency sound waves, they will create levitation. The higher the frequency, the higher the power and the energy, so you can lift huge things up and move it around as you want. Ice cream cones in your hands. Boy, those two schoolboys made my day. <laughs> there you go. What I find interesting is that average three centimeters, which equates to 10 gigahertz. So when we reverse engineer this, I'm looking for laboratories that work on, on laser technology. We can do some remarkable experiments, people. We'll change the world. We'll use these stones, and we're going to discover new energies. And we can, any volunteers, we can put you in front there, set it up, and see what happens if we, if we phase you out or if you're still there. <laughs> 10 gigahertz. So what have we learned from all of this? If we don't learn something from this information, it's completely wasted on us. And uh, I believe we're going to have a break now. Is, it, is that true? We're going to have a break? No, no, no. no break? <laughs> so uh, I was going to have a 10-minute break, but mostly for your sanity, I'm used to this. So I believe that we're reaching the conclusion of a prophecy. All the ancient cultures have these great, amazing prophecies that last thousands and thousands of years. And they, they say that the end days will be as the first days. Did you know that in 1980, 80, in the mid-80s, four of the North American uh, native tribes came to South Africa to meet with Kreda Mutwa and some of the African shaman because they believe that the new age will rise out of South Africa. It was quite amazing. And, uh, and they had all these ceremonies at, at these sacred sites and so forth. So the end days will be as the first days. Well, if humanity arose out of South Africa, then it should restart there again. And it makes me quite curious to see what's going on in South Africa at the moment. There's some really interesting things, and I seem to be involved in a few of those for some reason. But um, we're rediscovering free energy. We're discovering that sound is a source of energy. We just need to realize how to use it, figure out how to use all these ancient stone circles that give us insane amounts of free energy every second of the day. We just don't know how to use it. We're crossing the galactic plane. It's the rise and fall of civilizations, concluding these giant, as Plato called it, the great year. Um, and uh, we're exposed to frequencies and energies that we have probably haven't experienced in the last 26,000 years. So no wonder we're going through you know, turmoil and a lot of people are going crazy. They don't know how to deal with it. We're exposed to galactic light from the great sun, the, the cosmic... Uh, the center of our, of our galaxy, and we're exploding with consciousness. Why? Why are we exploding with consciousness? Because this, this galactic light is activating our DNA, and there's plenty of scientific evidence for that that you can go and look at if you still don't believe that. And it's doing amazing things. It's not just activating our junk DNA, 97% of it. So as our junk DNA gets activated, it creates a feedback mechanism, and we start to think higher thoughts, and our consciousness gets grows quicker and quicker. It's a beautiful thing, this, people. And it's all connected to these crazy people, you know, 280,000 years ago, building stone circles in South Africa. They created us and allowed us to get to this point where we can contemplate our own existence and our own humanness and figure out how we fit into this great, crazy picture. We connect to the morphogenic field and realize that the resonance is... The morphogenic the, is the substance of the morphogenic field and, and plays a very important role in, you know, spooky action at a distance that scientists are still trying to get wrap their heads around. How does this all work? And this is where I realized that if we don't learn something from this ancient civilization and apply it today, it's going to be completely wasted. So... I realized that these people lived for long, extended periods of time without money. <laughs>